As we begin, we would like to acknowledge that this service is being held by a community that gathers on stolen traditional lands of the Massachusetts, Nipmuc, Pawtucket, and Wampanoag people. We pay respect to those indigenous peoples who lost their lives in colonization of this land and recognize that these indigenous tribes are still today facing violations of sovereignty, territory, and water. We also give thanks for the earth we walk upon, the waters, the life-giving plants, and all the earth's creatures, as well as the winds, sun, moon, and stars. We recognize that this is just the first step in moving toward right relationship with uh, native peoples and healing of the earth. Good morning, and welcome to the First Parish Church of Stowe and Acton, a welcoming and spiritual community. My name is Bill Froberg, and I serve as your treasurer, as well as a member of the um, Memorial Garden Committee. If this is your first time with us, we welcome you. Please let us know you are, you are here by f filling out uh, one of our visitor information cards in the pews and hand it to an usher, drop it in the plate, or hand it to Meg, our welcoming staff member. Our minister and staff are listed on the front of the order of service. Please feel free to ask me or any of these people for more information about the church and its programs after the service, or by email or through the chat if you're online. Please refer to the order of service for the masking policy or ask an usher and check with people you're talking to about their comfort levels. If you would like a large print order of service or hymnal or an assisted listening device, please ask our ushers. Our assisted listening devices work throughout the building. If you would like to listen to the service from another space for any reason. After the service, please uh, join the Memorial Garden Committee um, in Fellowship Hall, uh, if you so choose um, with any questions that you would like to ask. Unfortunately, you're gonna to have to bring your own coffee. Um, after the service, uh, there were, will also be uh, Memorial Garden Committee members down at the Memorial Garden if you'd like a tour. I'd like to draw your attention to the announcements in our order of service, and also invite you to check out our webpage for more information. And you can also sign up there for our newsletter and email alerts. And now let us come together for a time of community singing and worship. Thank you, Bill. This summer service um, is being brought to you, as you can see, by the Memorial Garden Committee. Um, the topic for the service came from the fact that over the four, past four years of planning for this new sacred space and service to our community, it has become very, very clear all the social idiosyncrasies about death and how uncomfortable people are talking about death and grieving. Even the word death is avoided. When I looked at, uh, when I look on the line there, there, you know, when, when you look at death, there are endless options to say different words for death, just so we don't even say the word death. I'm sure even me saying the word death is making some of you feel uncomfortable. So a lot of people talk about it and they use words like passed on or gone to heaven, laid to rest, bit the dust, croaked, kicked the bucket. Pushing up daisies, one of my favorites, um, bought the farm, and but my ultimate favorite that I learned was popped their clogs. What is that? I'm <laughs> this, in, this service, hopefully for you, is an invitation to listen, to think about death, and to break those walls and to talk about losing your clogs. Seriously, we will all die, and we as a community have an opportunity to do it in connection with those around us. At this time, I'd like to um, ask Trish Walter to come up and light our chalice. I want to thank Trish and her 
partner Anatole for putting together some park benches um, that are going in the uh, memorial garden. So if you come down for a tour later and you need a place to sit, you'll have one. It's not very cool. So lighting the chalice, when it comes to death, I believe we are all children, someone once said. There is beauty in death. Of course, there is sadness and there is horror in the way some people die. But there is also beauty in the peace, in the divine, that we will all die. I invite you to stand and uh, if you are able in body or spirit uh, to our first hymn, number six in the gray hymnal just as long as I have breath. standing and repeat our covenant and affirmation. Love is the spirit of this church and service its law. This is our great covenant to dwell in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. the time for joys and sorrows. I ask uh, Marsha if you would come up, Marsha Rising, also a member of the Memorial Garden Committee, um, to come up and light the candles. And if the ushers would bring some uh, microphones to the people in the pews, if uh, they have a joy or sorrow to share. I also want to mention that uh, Elaine Spencer is not on the uh, uh, order of service. She's joining us with violin this morning, which has been wonderful. So if you have a joy or a sorrow, thank you. Um, if you have a joy or sorrow to share, please raise your hand and an usher will come to you. So we'll light one more candle for all those joys and concerns that 
are still held in our hearts um, and for those that have been shared. Thank you, Marcia. So Eileen Kramer, also a member of our uh, Memorial Garden Committee is gonna come up and read a poem followed by a short meditation. This is a poem by Mary Oliver, When Death Comes. This is a poem, can you hear me? Yeah? How about now? All right. When Death Comes by Mary Oliver. When death comes like the hungry bear in autumn. When death comes and takes all the bright coins from his purse to buy me and snaps the purse shut. When death comes like the measles pox. When death comes like an iceberg between the shoulder blades. I want to step through the door full of curiosity, wondering what is it going to be like, that cottage of darkness? And therefore I look upon everything as a brotherhood and a sisterhood. And I look upon time as no more than an idea. And I consider eternity as another possibility. And I think of each life as a flower, as common as a field daisy and as singular. And each name a comfortable music in the mouth, tending as all music does towards silence and each body a lion of courage and something precious to the earth. When it's over, I wanna say all my life, I was a bride married to amazement. I was the bridegroom taking the world into my arms. When it's over, I don't want to wonder if I have made of my life something particular and real. I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened or full of argument. I don't want to end up simply having visited this world. Are we ready to share gifts? Technical difficulty? So it, the video won't work? Okay. That's okay. We had a, uh, a video planned for our um, uh, sharing of gifts. Um, uh, so that uh, it was a, a poem uh, set by Lord Alfred Tennyson, um, Alfred Lord Tennyson, that was set to music by Salamander Crossing. And I don't know if you've ever heard of it, heard the poem or heard the music, but it's really a beautiful um, song. And a, uh, the words are very much talking about um, why don't we, the ushers, why don't you um, come and take the sharing of gifts while I explain what the song is about. Um, so in June, we are taking our weekly op offerings still for the organization for the Assabet River, which is uh, uh, oars. Uh, you may donate uh, with a check made out to First Paris Church or online. Um, the poem itself was a, uh, a, a discussion about 
explaining death or giving a cinnamon for death uh, as far as like a sandbar and sort of crossing the sandbar into the wide ocean. It's a really beautiful poem and uh, I invite you to uh, uh, take a, a read or listen. Just give a moment for the offertory. Life is lifey, right, Lisa? <laughs> All right. So we'll now do our uh, next reading uh, by Bill. Thank you for coming up and uh, reading our next reading. It's also by Mary Oliver, uh, entitled uh, In Blackwater Woods. Look, the trees are turning their own bodies into pillars of light, are giving off the rich fragrance of cinnamon and fulfillment. The long tapers of cattails are bursting and floating away over the blue shoulders of the ponds. And every pond, no matter what its name is, is nameless now. Every year, everything I have ever learned in my lifetime leads back to this, the fires and the black river of loss, whose other side is salvation, whose meaning none of us will ever know. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things, to love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it, and when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. Okay. So now comes the uh, sermon. One. Mine is described as uh, we talked about reflections on end of life. The top of my paper says sermon on death. Okay, so just hope you. <laughs> I'm embracing the word. In 1976, when I was five years old, my father survived a serious heart attack. I don't remember the event, but the fact that he could die of another heart attack was something that lived in the household, but was never talked about. Do we have sound back? We have sound. Okay, I'll just fix this in a second and we'll get it. I feel like the universe did all of that so I could notice that my sister's in the room. I love you, thank you for coming, it means a lot. So I'm gonna start again with feeling. In 1976, when I was five years old, my father survived a serious heart attack. I don't remember the event, but the fact that he could die of another heart attack was something that lived in the household, but was never talked about. It was kind of like Voldemort. To mention it would bring it coming. Adding perspective, my father was read his last rites seven times before he finally died in 2010, when I was 39, giving me 35 years of living with death as a silent presence. Awareness of death certainly had our family develop close ties. But looking back, it's easy to see how both my father's intention of not negatively impacting my life and my not wanting to upset or argue with a dying man denied us both a deeper connection. I'm proud of the fact as a young adult, I worked to become my father's friend with casual conversations about his childhood experiences dating before my mother, geeky engineering things, this interaction grew so that during his final stay in the hospital, we talked about his bucket list miss. He solved 
but had not submitted the answer to a million dollar mathematics question. That day, we also talked about his fear of dying and that it was centered on his love for his family and wanting to always be with us. We talked a while about death. This final conversation impacted me more than he ever learned. My father opened up to me, wholly connected with me in a way I had never done with him. It was not any dramatic conversation. It was said in the same casual manner of our talking, but his quiet, open introspection on death has since colored many of my memories of him, discussing the cosmos, the divinity of a Pentagon. My grief for my father was a complicated thing. I invited nobody to the funeral. I helped get the obit in the paper and funeral arrangements done, but I personally informed no one. After the funeral, I was in a fog for months and didn't seriously cry until four months later. Okay, for this, this community who often sees me cry, this is likely shocking. <laughs> okay. It would take years after my father's death to understand and unravel the effects of silently living with death created. But the one truth I want to share with this community is that that one conversation made a difference. It is never too soon to ask and talk about death to those that you love. Despite having 35 years to do so, my father and I almost missed having our chance. And personally, I count it as one of the most meaningful experiences of connection in my entire life. It was not until the death of my dog, Autumn, this past February, that I truly understood the lasting impact of my father's open and genuine discussion and the path that it took me. When Autumn came into our family, she was 14 weeks old. Her sweet countenance fulfilled my every maternal instinct that I have to give. I not just watched, but engaged in the arc of her life. And we found out that she had term terminal cancer. I made a different choice than I did when I was a child with my father. I leaned in. I opened my heart more, spent more time with her, dared getting closer instead of putting up emotional barriers to, to protect myself. And when she died, I told people, I took time for myself. I opened up to others about my grief and allowed myself to receive compassion. Being present with life is opening yourself to all the beautiful, painful aspects of it, most especially death. I hope telling you this hard-won truth challenges your own social, social norms and dares your fear to see the opportunity you have in asking and sharing reflections on death even once with those that you love. I spent decades living like my father was dying and almost missed that the casual relationship we were able to build had the depth of connection I could learn to lean on well beyond his death. In closing, I thought of quoting Tim McGraw's Live Like You're Dying, <laughs> inspiring you to skydive and ride bulls and love deeper. Or repeat verse from Mary Oliver, but those had more fanfare and eloquence than in comparison to the raw truth that I discovered. The closest thing I found was a letter that Trish shared with me by Sullivan Bayou, a Civil War major to his wife just before his death. Our closing song is a waltz from the Civil War um, PBS story that 
was uh, that he is featured in. He stated, quote, my love for you is deathless. It seems to bind me with mighty cables that nothing but omnipotence can break. My love for you is deathless. Beautifully said. But that is not me. Not me coming to you openly as my father did. So in closing, I will read you a poem that I wrote after Autumn died my puppy. It was my personal attempt at expressing what I was feeling as I grieved in the truth I ultimately discovered from crying, sharing, and talking about her death. Okay. Grief rises. Few things in life in this universe have transformative power. Unlike fire, grief comes as a tidal wave, stripping surety and understanding before saturation. Words, feelings, muscle, drown in unassailable waters before grief rises to anoint you in joyful sorrow over and over, rising and falling, rising and falling, suspending time as it consumes, drains, lifts, porous, naked, drifting between sky and current, the ebbing wane of grief erodes, unburdens, and reveals the essence of that which you have lost, what will remain, and how forever you will be changed. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Can people hear me okay? I assume, Joe, we don't have the little clip. Last month, when I was putting my grandson Holden, age 10, to bed, he asked, what happens when we die, Gammy? Is it like being trapped in a dark closet? That would be scary. Or maybe we could come back as ghosts flying around. I told him that no one knows for certain but that as a Jewish person, I believe we live on in the ways we love and touch the lives of others. He is being raised Catholic with some notion of heaven and hell. I said some religions offer a belief in reincarnation, that we could come back as a beloved puppy dog named Molly or a goldfish named Queen Bob. Then he said, and this is true, if Albert Einstein was alive, maybe he could figure it out. Or, he said, maybe Elon Musk. <laughs> and that was before he purchased Twitter. And then he said his prayers, and I went downstairs grateful beyond belief that he chose to ask me such an important question. Seems I've always been comfortable speaking about death, but not about the pain and suffering that can accompany the dying process. And I've also loved visiting cemeteries. I find them beautiful and deeply peaceful. The older, the better. I particularly love visiting the one below the lighthouse on Monhegan Island off the coast of Maine. The Mount Auburn Cemetery with its beautiful plantings in Cambridge or the one next to my elementary school in Jacobsville, Maryland, where after school, I would steal flowers from the grounds to bring home to my mother. And I have lost too many far too many people I loved much too young. My father at 52, my sister Emily at 49, best friend Gail at 37. The list is long, much too long. And their, their deaths have given me more opportunity to ponder what it is I want when it is my time. 
In traditional Jewish families, funerals are to occur within 24 hours after a death, as embalming is considered a sacrilege. Our bodies are to be returned to God whole. Now I knew for certain that I did not want to be buried or laid to rest in the Baltimore Cemetery where my parents and grandparents are buried. But I was uncertain what it is I wanted or where, and that uncertainty made me anxious. So I started to think. At first, I thought I would have my ashes scattered off the cliffs at Burnt Head on Monhegan Island. It is the place I think of as my geographic home, spiritual home. But after my grandsons were born, I realized I wanted them to have a specific place where they could come to remember me, assuming they would want to do that. A place that was not a four hour car ride, plus an hour ferry trip, and a 30 minute hike up the headland. But there was no clear alternative. So when I visited the Memorial Garden at Mount Vernon Unitarian, in Alexandria, Virginia, the home church of our then intern, Eileen Gillespie, a light bulb went off. I realized what a blessing it would be to have my ashes in a place that was my spiritual home, close to where my family and dear friends lived, and suggested the idea to the board of trustees, not knowing what I was getting into almost four years ago, to explore what would be involved. Many years ago in a two year training program I took in spiritual psychology, I was exposed to the Buddhist notion of living with death sitting on my shoulder, reminding me not to waste time, that life was finite and opportunities to live and to love and to learn and contribute needed to be grabbed. So I've taken more risks in love and work and life in general than some might think prudent and have been motivated to not take no for an answer. And that includes moving a few boulders, both figurative and real, to make our garden into a reality. And here we are. The design has been created by Sonia. The granite, the recycled granite from Maine has been purchased fortunately four years ago before prices went up. The ground has been prepared by many of you for our sacred bed. And in August, the granite will be installed and we anticipate a dedication in October. And I can honestly say that I find that I can rest easy knowing where my remains will be scattered. And now, if you will turn to a uh, number 1002 in your teal hymnal and rise in body or spirit to sing comfort me. And now a benediction. It's a poem that I'm going to read by Rebecca Elson, who was both a Canadian astronomer and a poet who died in her early 30s. And it's called Antidotes to Fear of Death. Sometimes as an antidote to fear of death, I eat the stars. Those nights lying on my back, I suck them from the quenching dark till they are all, all inside me, pepper hot and sharp. Sometimes instead, I stir myself into a universe still young, still warm as blood, not outer space, just space, the light of all the not yet stars drifting like a bright mist and all of us and everything already there, but unconstrained by form. And sometimes it's enough to lie down here on earth beside our long ancestral bones, to walk across the cobble fields of our discarded skulls, each like a treasure, like a chrysalis, thinking, 
Whatever left these husks flew off on bright wings. And now um, our closing song, Arise in Body and Spirit if you are able. Thank mm-hmm. you.